Good afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to take time to acknowledge that we are gathering here today in London, Ontario, on the traditional lands of the Ashinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Nunapawe, and Atawandaran peoples. Thank you. Welcome to the 2020 James Rainey Memorial Lecture. My name is Carolyn Doyle, and I'm delighted to host this year's program titled Words and Music. I would like to extend a warm wishes this afternoon to you, our audience, joining us from far and wide. Certainly one of the limited advantages of a pandemic. Now in its 11th year, the James Rainey Memorial Lecture celebrates the legacy of Canadian poet and playwright, James Criar, Jamie Rainey, with a talk by a distinguished speaker, or today we have speakers, who are knowledgeable about the life and work of Rainey, as well as the literary and cultural history of the southwestern Ontario region. Previous speakers have included Colleen Thibodeau, Jean Mackay, John Beckwith, David Ferry, Tom Gary, Tom Smart, Tim Inkster, Marion Johnson, and Peter Denny, and last year, of course, Stan Dragland. The Memorial Lecture Series is one way that the Rainey family, Susan Rainey and James Rainey, celebrate the legacy of their parents. I would encourage you to check out the websites at Susan Rainey Helms, ColleenThibodeau.com and JamesRainey.com, respectively. Words Festival is thrilled to have the opportunity to present this year's James Rainey Memorial Lecture entitled Words and Music, which features the words and poetry of James Rainey, set to the beautiful music and musical compositions of Stephen Hollowitz and Oliver Whitehead. And if the title Words and Music sounds familiar, it should. The old Words and Music store was a downtown London, Ontario landmark in the 1960s and 1970s, where Jamie and Colleen bought books, records, concerts, theater tickets. Words and Music was for them a cultural outpost for the Rainey family. Now a little bit about our musical composers featured here today, Stephen Hollowitz and Oliver Whitehead. Stephen Hollowitz is Director of Music at St. James Anglican Church in London, Ontario, and along with Oliver Whitehead, was co-composer for the Antler River Project. Stephen has recorded two CDs of original arrangements of traditional hymns and gospel music, as well as music for the Grand Theatre. Stephen can be seen and heard performing with Denise Pelly, Paul Stevenson, and the contemporary folk group Celtic Shift. Oliver Whitehead is an all-round guitarist and composer in London. He has composed for orchestras, choirs, jazz combos, and has received a Juno nomination for Best Jazz Album, as well as the Forest City London Music Award for World Music. His musical collaborations with Stephen Hollowitz and Sonia Gustafson span a period of more than 20 years. Welcome to you both today. Welcome, Oliver. Okay, I think I'm unmuted and I'm, I think I'm displayed. Steve, Great. I and see you as well. Thank Great. you, Carolyn. I would like to begin by asking, what was it about the words that drew you to the work of James Rainey and to this work in particular? Well, Steve, you go first because you, you were the one who decided on it. Yeah, um, there was a, a tribute to Jamie um, at the Wolf some years ago uh, where there were various snippets of compositions and I remember excerpts from the John Beckwith operas it was a it was a fabulous night and um, I cannot recall when it was but it was certainly before these songs were composed and it uh, as as being sort of a composer at the time looking for things that were both regional and uh, kind of enigmatic that would lend itself to um, you know both Oliver and I kind of exist both in a a classical jazz pop hybrid world, and um, those those poems were miniatures in a in a sense, and that that I think appealed to either my laziness or my lack of confidence with with the uh, with the genre. But uh, the idea of a miniature seemed that it was doable, 
and yet they were the enigmatic enough that they allowed a, a lot of freedom in uh, in musical idea and interpretation. And I think did I bring them to you, Oliver? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you did. Uh, uh, just just so everyone is clear, this is what what you really hit upon was this uh, short cycle of little miniature poems called Brush Strokes Decorating a Fan, which has a little poem, a miniature poem for every letter of the alphabet. And we're, we're sort of still, we haven't got through the alphabet yet. There may be more to come, but you brought them to me. Yeah, and I, I unearthed some old emails where we kind of um, sorted out who was going to set which, which of these poems to music. Yeah. There's a bit of back and forth about it. So, and, and so as I mean, I've always, I never really knew a, a lot of Jamie's work till I came to London, but I always knew of him in Thunder Bay because there's a woman up there uh, for a theater company, Susie Turnbull was with Cam Lab Theater and she had a close association with Jamie. And so I always, she says, oh, you're in London. You should check out James Rainey. And, and, and the only time it happened is we bumped into Colleen and Jamie at the Grand Theater coming out of uh, one, Jeff Culbert did a production of One Man Mask there. And we bumped into the two of them and it was sort of like shaking of hands. And then the next time we saw him was at Mount Hope uh, when he, he was in the hospital there. Yeah, this so, was in the fall of 2007. I went back over the, the whole timeline of this. I couldn't remember when it was, okay. Yeah, I don't know which month or day, but it was the fall of 2007. When we actually went to to see him, and you you sort of initiated this, and we went there to kind of get his blessing and you know ask him if what he thought about us setting him to music and, and yeah. Was that before or after the birthday party, Oliver? Did oh, that I don't remember. I think it. I don't know. I I think it was before. It yeah. may have been because one of. I, well, that meeting at Mount Hope was interesting because uh, Jamie seemed most concerned about who was going to be paying for the endeavor and uh, it, where, yeah. where the granting process was coming from. And we had to, he didn't quite believe us when we were assure, reassuring him that we were just doing this for our own amusement and recreation, as it were. Um, but he did request, and I don't remember how it requested, but he wanted music at his birthday party, which ended up being his final birthday. And uh, I remember going to Mount Hope and we played Beatles song. Yeah. And, and actually, the first of the brush strokes, um, what we, we presented to him at that. I, uh, think, um, I, I think I got that day too. I think it was March 2008 when that happened. Okay. Um, but yeah, to be honest, I don't quite remember that. I, it's possible I personally wasn't involved. In I, don't, I don't think you were in town. Yeah, and, and uh, because we had well, this. Well, actually, I do know what happened. That's one thing. I... <laughs> yeah, March two thousand eight. That's when my that was the the month that my my brother oh. was away in Ireland, and I had to go. I had to rush over there. That's probably what happened. So I think the beauty of the poems, but, all, but also this strong urge to make contact with this great literary figure and to, to at least try to do something, you know, maybe a, a con, more of a contemporary, is that fair, but more of a hybrid musical genre as opposed to it being strictly art song or classical type compositions. Yeah, yeah, listening to them back, I mean, I'm struck really by how uh, they are mostly in a kind of pop, folk, jazz sort of idiom rather than uh, what, what people would recognize as art. Yeah, like mostly, what you... Mostly not like that, yeah. Yeah, and especially considering his association with John Beckwith, it really is far removed from the language of John Beckwith, you know, so... I would think so, yeah. yeah. That's wonderful that you actually um, met with Jamie and had his blessings and that he was able to to hear a couple of these pieces that makes it that much more meaningful and poignant kind of as we move forward. Yeah, and I think he, he was at a show, he was at the concert, wasn't he, when, uh, at First St. Andrews, when we actually did the premiere of the whole, the first batch of them that we wrote. And that, I've got a date for that as well. I think that was, um, let's see, that was, uh, in February of 2008, we did a, an Apple River show at First St. Andrews. I remember that, yeah. Uh, the last day, February 29th. I, oh, February 15th, yeah. I remember Colleen and Jean Mackay being there in the front row. 
And the challenge I remember from that was she said, oh, well, you could never do that with my poems. There's way too many words in my poem. <laughs> but we did. <laughs> and we showed. Yeah. Well, I'm sure our audience is um, eager to, to hear some of this music now. So why don't we um, introduce the musicians that you worked with um, um, to produce some of this. And we're very excited to have joining us in the musical recordings and also joining us today, flautist Ingrid Crossman, who has performed with many orchestras and ensembles across Canada and has toured China with the Ontario Festival Symphony Orchestra. She's taught flute at the University of Calgary, Mount Royal College, Medicine Hall College, and the Inner London UK Education Authority, and now has her works with the London Youth Symphony and has a, her flute studio with private students in London. Sonia Gustafson is an award-winning jazz songstress with a unique style and polish. Sonia is an accomplished, classically trained soprano and is a popular guest with symphonies, choirs, and big bands alike. She's released two CDs which re receive regular CBC airplay. This multifaceted performer is an engaging songstress who connects deeply with her audience and shares her love of song with passion. And that's really going to come out today um, in the recordings of these works. Uh, so Stephen, we, um, do you want to set up the first set of pieces that we're now going to hear from today from Bash Strokes Decorating a Fan? Sure. Um, so Oliver and I arrived at some sort of negotiation as how we were going to split them up. and. Um, it was kind of interesting just to see which ones we each gravitated towards. Um, the In Bed at Night almost seemed to me a, a, a prelude, a, a very kind of inside piece, whereas the other three pieces to me are outdoor pieces. This first one was an indoor piece uh, of, of domesticity. And in fact, we added a previous song, Domicile, before this one uh, in a later version of the set. So almost like a, 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 a peaceful... Uh, a lullaby or, or a sort of, a, of a co the coziness of the, the inside of the home. Whereas the other pieces, um, you know, the sentence of person actually mentions Huron Street, the, the uh, you know, the, the locale of, of Jamie and Colleen, and then sort of very envi environment things with the wind and the leaves and the orchard. So this to me is the exception of the pieces that I wrote, where it's very tranquil and very serene. Great. So first up we'll have we'll listen to In Bed at Night. <laughs>
That's so beautiful. Dear, good things that wait. Mm -hmm. Now, next, we're going to listen to a sentence of persons. Josh is just queuing that up for us now. A one, two, a one, two, three, four. Beautiful. Next up, we're going to hear the wind, which is combined with the stanza leaves speak. Um, did you want to say anything about that, Steve? Or well, that the one we just heard, it just has sort of that gentle, sort of cool shuffle of, uh, of the on Huron Street, which is maybe the coolest street in London. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, it, but it just has that kind of uh, lazy, jazzy feel. Uh, to represent the outside. The wind has got quite, what I would call about this is a very cool flute part. It was quite uh, deliberately trying to, to kind of mimic the wind sound. And then leaves, we experimented with some sound effects and sound poetry. Um, so there were def definite deliberate musical decisions made based on the text of these next two. Great. And a perfect day for a November afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> that we're going to hear is the stanza um, Orchard. Did you have anything that you wanted to add for that one, Stephen? Sonia is always very exuberant about this one. She, uh, I think she likes the hoedown country rhythm that's kind of put in here. Next to sour red and yellow crab, then 
and the Ben Davis Scarlet. Not right too much. That was fun. So all of those um, compositions were in that set were put together by by Stephen Hollowitz. So thank you, Stephen, for for each of those. Thanks, Carol. It was really fun to hear the performances back. That's the first time I've heard them, and uh, they sound great. So thanks to all our musical colleagues here. I, I just got a, a message from our research department here, uh, Adam. Um, so the birthday party was September first, two thousand and seven. So I think, Oliver, we must have got the Mount Hope visit must have been before that, because that's when the request for music at his birth at Jim's birthday was. Right. And then we wrote the songs and then they were premiered that February. So uh, I think that's the chronology. And then yeah. we, so the birthday party was was another thing that I guess was the second. Yeah, it was the right. second. I think that was after our first visit. So yeah. that was from the research department here. So thank you, Carolyn. That was, that was fun to listen That's to. Great. Our first set of brush strokes. Interesting to to hear how um, how different each one of them is. It's just like a little splash of of an idea or a suggestion that comes yeah. out from each yeah. stanza. Yeah. So our next set of um, pieces, our next set of stanzas, are um, are all compositions by Oliver. And um, do you have anything you would like to? Say to set these up, Oliver, or how James's uh, words have inspired or informed. Yeah, him. yeah. Um, well, um, I guess the uh, shall I just um, say maybe a little bit of introduction to each one separately because I think yes. that's so. Uh, yes, of I course. Think, I think the first one up is um, Ernest Barber Salon, and um, this is really one of my favorites. In that whole series, uh, it's uh, this little tribute to Ernie Taylor, and Ernie Taylor was a barber uh, who worked on Huron Street, you know, near where the Rainiers lived, and he was quite a sort of well-known local character. And he went on barbering till he was uh, really quite an elderly guy, you know, at least in his seventies. I think that's important in the piece. I think probably by the time. I think by the time James Rainey wrote that, he was already, you know, quite a veteran. And I think that's important. Um, and, you know, so at first blush, you know, the piece is just about Ernie in his barber shop. Um, but, you know, Rainey, I, I think it shows something about Rainey's poetry, which is that he, he likes to mythologize the everyday, you know, everyday people and places. And so pretty, pretty close pretty soon after the beginning of the, of the song, in fact, in the very second line, we have Ernie being transformed into something more than just, you know, a person in London, Ontario, because he, he becomes Mr. Delilah, Mr. Delilah the barber. So, you know, here we have something which is sapping your strength somehow, like, you know, Delilah, absent. And then, and then, um, so you think, well, what is this? You know, what's what's happening next? And then, and then he drops this very heavy metaphor um, in the next line, which is when he starts talking about him sizing, being like somebody sizing. And uh, of course, you you know, you could think, oh, it, you know, uh, the cliche is you know the Grim Reaper, but I think it's actually time that he's talking about. I think you know what he does is he transforms this in, into a little vignette, a little poem about time. Um, and, um, you know, the man with the scythe. And um, time is just that thing that kind of slowly just keeps everything revolving around. And so time, of course, is, is a very good subject for music. 
but the music for me of that, that piece just just came from um, the the feel. I mean, actually, having said all this interpretation of the poem, the the song itself is very short and very simple. And what it is, it just gives a feel. It's, it gives a sort of jazz, relaxed, easy swing. It's basically a kind of blues. And um, I got that from partly the the uh, image of him in his barber shop, which was which was below street level, so you have to duck down below ground. And so that gave me the feeling of a sort of dive, you know, going down to a dive and and going some, somehow sort of uh, walking out of out into an earlier time into some kind of speakeasy or barrel house mm. saloon, you know. And I wanted the music to somehow evoke that. And then also the sort of easy swing of the music is also the swing of the side. Oh, and James, James just told me just just today or yesterday he told me something really interesting about about Ernie, which was that he actually had a heart condition and he um, he had this monitor which which monitored the beating of his heart, uh, and so that just uh, feeds in perfectly to the this idea of the, you know the the ticking of time. Uh, and um, and and the rhythm of the side and the rhythm. Of the Having said all that, you know, I, I've probably taken about two or three times as long as the song itself. <laughs> let's listen to it. Let's listen to it. Can you hear what they're saying? I love that cut yeah. the field of hair, and it yeah. does have that speakeasy kind of feel to it. Yeah. And the place itself has it looks like a speakeasy when you drive by and still see it from the outside. It's lovely. Yeah. yeah, it's like a vision. You can imagine the the old guys back in the day sitting there smoking their cigars and chewing the fat. You know. I remember going in there actually with my dad, hmm. going there on yeah. a Saturday afternoon. Yeah getting pop from the machine, yeah. yeah um, do you want to set up um, Dark of the Moon for yeah, us? Yeah, Dark of the Moon. That's um, uh, another uh, little um, piece of whimsy, I guess. It's, um, I think it brings out the sense of almost uh, kind of childlike wonder in some of you know, James Rainey's poems. It's just this idea that, you know, that, that, that there is a, a time in in every monthly cycle of the moon where it's actually completely obscure, so you can't you can't see it. Well, I, or maybe not every month. I don't know. Is it every month, or is this an eclipse of the moon? Or something? Not sure. But anyway, on this particular night, there is no moon, and uh, so you know the moon is obviously a big symbol in poetry. It's always a symbol of mystery, but it's it's doubly mysterious when it's not there. And so the poem is just this this playful kind of meditation on. The night sky without the moon in it. So, 
uh, I don't think I have to say much more. I mean, musically, it's a nocturne. You know, it's a nocturne. It's got very quiet. Um, the uh, it's just voice and guitar, so very quiet. And the guitar part is kind of low in the register, and um, it's all it's all kind of viewed and and hopefully gives you a bit of that sense of the mystery. Good. We're going to listen next to Dark of the Moon. So hauntingly beautiful. Mm. It's lovely. Well, um, you know, it, it, it comes from the poem. And, and it, like like many of his other poems, it, it's just right there on the page, it's it's a song lyric, you know, it just it just begs to be set to music. It, it's even got its you know musical rhythm to it. Yeah. Um our next two are, have some similarities, and um I know a book and I mm. know an experience. And mm. do you want to talk about those for a minute now, Oliver? Yeah, but uh, similar titles. Um, I think, yeah, I think the subjects are a little different. But um, I know a book is, is, is again, sort of a playful little whimsical image. It's just, it takes the idea of a person reading a book and then turns it upside down. It's, it, in this little poem, it's the, it's the book that reads the person. So I think he's sort of trying to say that books um, tell us something about ourselves, a mirror that we that we, we find out about ourselves and maybe they know more about us than we do, so they read us. Um, and then it ends with this funny line, um, they can see nobody uh, up the road. And that's, that's very enigmatic. It's nobody up a case. So it's not just they, can, they can't see anyone. It's they can see nobody with, who is some kind of an entity, some person. So who is this nobody? Um, is it an imaginary character that you see in a book, or, or is it just, you know, I, I'll leave that to, to each reader to, to think about. And then as far as the music goes, um, the text, uh, the other sort of main thing about the poem is that there's a lot about space in it. Um, they can see farther up than up, they can see farther down and down. So it sort of covers the whole field of vision range. And um, so I kind of took that rather literally, and you'll, you'll hear the, the vocal line, rising on the up and falling down uh, on the down. Uh, I know a book. Uh, oh, and maybe I can then introduce the other one too. Shall I talk about I know an experience? The second one, I know an experience, is about, um, well, it's, it's about a long, a very long-term relationship between two people, uh, obviously, you know, James and his wife, Colleen, um, and the kind of way in which they become intertwined and almost uh, interchanged as people. And um, so uh, it, it's, it's a poem that seems to me to fall into two parts. The, it begins with this, this uh, image, this metaphor on the page of being like a butterfly, butterfly's wings that open and close. And, uh, and, and you don't quite know what he's getting at there. It's just a symbol on the page. But I, I found that intriguing musically. And actually, if you, if, if you look at the, the musical score, uh, I, I tried to write it so the notes on the page were actually sort of arranged in a way that sketched out a shape of wings. 
So, you know, the, the voice part and the piano part are sort of inversions of each other. Um, well, I guess you have to say it. But, and then, then um, it kind of switches and suddenly uh, he starts to talk about time over the years, ourselves have been funded. And then, so, so we're into a narrative idea. And so at that point, musically, I kind of completely switch it into almost like a new song. That's where the guitar comes in and it becomes almost like a sort of ballad, a sort of folk ballad of how, how things have changed over, uh, over time. Um, and they're, they're sort of involved in these cycles of, uh, of interaction and separation and blending again. So, um, yeah, so let's listen to these, these two then. First of all, I know a book and then I know an experience. Good. First up, we'll listen to I Know a Book. And we'll all have a chance to kind of contemplate who, uh, who is nobody. Mm, yes. I know a book that opened the people and reads them, spreads them out pleat by pleat till they see as far up as up, till they see farther, far than down. It makes so sharp their eyes that east or west they can spot nobody. Coming up the That's so lovely. Um, while uh, Josh is queuing up, I know an experience. I have to say that that, as a librarian, that's that's one of my my very favorite of all of these. Well, it's, it's the anthem. And the I anthem love of that. All yeah. I love that that phrase in it as it opens up pleat by pleat. It kind of mm. again kind of refers back to that brush strokes decorating a fan, and you know that Oriental fan that pleats open and shut and reveals different images. It's it's really yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and that pleating comes into the next one too. Yes. I, I pleating and I'm pleating, yeah. Yes, that's that's why I had said there was yeah. some similarity to Yes, yes, pleating. you're quite right. Pleating. Yes. Well spotted. <laughs> <laughs> Two sides of a bird. 
so another musical thing there was I, I deliberately I know Sonia has breath that goes on forever so I so I, I put a lot of whole notes all all tied together so that she could maybe she she'll have a breath. chance to uh, to talk about that in a, yeah, just a couple yeah. of minutes we just yeah. have one more piece left one more stanza left from breaststrokes decorating a fan and I think that it's the final stanza from the poem so it'll be the 26th stanza mm -hmm. um up a walk and i think that that was a piece that you and stephen collaborated on together yeah well sort of we we kind of um well steve why don't you tell the story of it i think we both inadvertently said it uh, we, we each thought we were doing that poem. <laughs> that's right <laughs> and, uh, and they they seem to fit together really well um i always saw Mine is sort of a companion piece to the first one, the um, uh, In Bed at Night. Um, whereas, you know, as I said, that was to me an interior and inside piece. I saw this this part, this stanza as coming back in from the outside world back into the home. Sure. And there, there's a certain sacrificial element in the text. I mean, with the idea of 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 the 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 wood or the twig or whatever being offered into the stove and ascending into heaven. So to me, it was always reflective, um, but joyful in a way, um, in, in sort of an inevitable way. And then Oliver's, I think, is whereas mine is maybe a little pensive, I think Oliver's is definitely very joyful. So the two of them really did dovetail nicely together when we eventually put them side by side. Yeah, I think I think one of us had to change the key, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah. Know. I don't recall who, but anyway, I think it was an E flat, E flat in the end. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that's true that's... collaboration then. So next yeah. we'll be, uh, we'll listen to up a, uh, a walk. So we're uh, going to be capturing all from In Bed at Night was stanza A, and this is stanza Z. So mm -hmm. A to Z, up a walk. <laughs> Into a house I ran. They put me in the stall. Out its chimney smoke I rose. I rose into heaven's land. Amazing. I wonder if now we can bring in um, Sonia and Ingrid. Just, um, I, just for a I, second, Carolyn, our research yeah. department is right on this um, broadcast. <laughs> but um, his theory is that Up a Walk is about a newspaper. Oh, which is kind of a cool image. And that it is a cool image. Kind of fits. Who's, 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 who's theory? Adam's theory is it's a it's. Oh a, yeah. Well. I mean, it always it always did strike me as like up a walk into a house I went. I put me in a stove. What am I? And it's, you know, it's kind of phrased like yeah. one of those riddles. A riddle. A newspaper could be it. Yeah. It's a tribute to younger James's career, you know. Yeah, the free press. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what wonderful um, music it must be to to perform. I wanted to maybe turn it first to to Ingrid. The flute sections are just absolutely stunning. I wondered if you wanted to to talk for a minute about about what it's like performing these pieces. It's been great to tell you the truth. It's um, I came in on a little bit later in the the collaborations. I just last year around this time, I guess Oliver had asked me if I would 
um, work on these pieces with them for a performance we did in January. And it was just, um, as a classically trained flute player, it was so nice to and refreshing to do something a little bit out of my uh, what I would normally do. And um, I just loved the way the flute interacted with the words and sort of was the musical, musical equivalent of what the words were um, depicting or what Sonia would be singing and I would sort of um, comment on that or if it was a butterfly, then maybe my part would sound like a butterfly or in the wind, you know, your wind, you can hear it weaving in and out of the, the vocal line or the poetry. So that's been quite... Um, it's just been a, a wonderful experience for me and and working with these three other people has just been fantastic. Well, the playing was great too. <sighs> Thanks. It just it just brings a, a whole other dimension to the music and and to the expression of the words. It was it's really incredible, Ingrid. Yeah. Yes, and thank you. And also just the characters, like going from one, like I just felt the music really brought out the different moods and expression or um mm -hmm the intention of the, the poetry. And that was really, that was really nice. Thank you. Now, Sonia, oh my gosh, you do have notes that go on and on uh, <laughs> in these pieces. And I get the impression that some of those notes were, uh, were written for you. <laughs> um, yeah, um, when, when the guys told me about um, the idea for these, songs um i was really excited because i i have a music degree from western in classical music so um singing a lot of art song which is a lot of you know poetry set to music um often in another language so you're you know you're doing the research and, and figuring out what this poem means but also what each and every word means and on the flip side of that i'm singing jazz gigs with oliver and steve um you know, where it's very, it's very casual and very, very direct, like you deliver it to your audience and they understand it, they don't need a translation. And so I found these songs really exciting because they were, um, I mean, first of all, in English, so you could really understand it, but like the, the riddle sort of quality to them. And every time I sang them, I sort of discover something new about them. Um, I always loved that or found a different angle or way of, of looking at it and understanding it. And but also that they're about these local places, um, you know, like that barbershop. I, like, I've never been in there, but I've passed it a million times. And um, yeah, I, I love it. It's like I've met all of these people that have contributed to making these songs. Um, but yeah, they were so much fun to deliver because I found that the music that uh, Stephen and Oliver both wrote really embodied the words and delivered them in in a in a perfect way. So um, I, I really enjoyed working on it. Every time we revisit, I'm like, I, I'm saying, we got to do this again. Okay, when's our next, when are we going to do these again? And well, maybe more next time. Were, yeah, I remember when uh, we were, when you were recording that day at Aeolian Hall um, and there were um, two pieces that weren't included and you, you said, I love this music so much. Can we please do another two? because I don't want to go yeah. home <laughs> without yeah. doing more of this. So, this, so like it, you can really tell that you really embody the passion of the words and really deliver that to the audience. Yeah, well, and, and I just love, I love the miniature idea of it too. Like there's no sort of, there's really very little repeated text and rhyming. It, there's these little vignettes, right? And, and you're trying to figure out and pull the meaning out of it. And, you know, some of them are, you know, sort of a little bit of a mystery. Um, I don't know, I really enjoy that. It's very different from the other types of poetry I'm used to singing, you know, where sometimes a lot of it can be very similar, you know, writing about love or or about, you know, the trees and, and the wind. And, and this one, like you really hear them. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're quite unique. That's wonderful, thank you. Well, and we're going to um, hear your uh, your songs take on a little different persona in the, the next set, moving away from from James Rainey. But I wanted to to give you a chance to to, to talk about brushstrokes decorating a fan before we before we went to that place. So mm -hmm. thank you. Um, we have a really um, 
special um, treat, a special addition to this year's James Rainey Memorial Lecture in that we're going to close our program this afternoon with two poems of Colleen Thibodeau, um, Jamie's wife and partner of 56 years and always named and by James Stuart Rainey as London's finest poet, um, one to which many I know agree. So um, I wonder if we can, if Stephen and um, Oliver, if we can have you um, say a few opening comments about um, about working now with um, with Colleen's work. Well, the, uh, my memory of running is of running into Colleen at Oxford Bookshop when it was on Richmond, and um, and she was purchasing a book that mentioned something about. Uh, their time in Winnipeg, and uh, and I was introduced to her um, by Hillary, who was running uh, the store, at the, and uh, and we talked for about a, an hour about this uh, entry in this in this book about J Jamie and Colleen's life in Winnipeg, and she knew about the brushstroke songs at the time. It was after we had done the brushstrokes, and I said to her, "Well, we should be setting your poems." And that's when she made the line that there are far too many words in her poems that they could never be set to music. And I said we were up for the challenge. And uh, Oliver and I were in the, the group, the Ant the River Project, at the time, and so it was one of those back burner projects. And um, when Colleen passed away, uh, our son Adam uh, met with uh, James Jr. and uh, Susan Rainey and uh, started going through some of the letters and uh, some of the other poetry. And the idea was to use some of the, uh, the poems from that collection, the Artemis, do you remember? I don't forget. Artemisia the, book, yeah. That, the, the, the pinkish book. Um, that Carolyn will hold up right here, that book. And so it was quite deliberate that they went through the book along with the letters that James and Susan uh, gave Adam access to, and he put to get together the show. And my recollection was that it was sort of, I came to Oliver and said, well, which ones do you want to do? And which ones do am I going to do? I think, does that sort of seem right, Oliver? I, that's my memory of it. Yeah, pretty much. Because I mean, obviously it was Adam's show and I think you were the kind of driving force and I, uh, I'm glad you brought me in. Um, it, uh, and I was really glad to be to be able to pick a few and um, and work on them because they were different, very different from James's poetry. They're not they're sort of harder to crack, you know. They're slightly more opaque in a way. Um, and and less uh, of that song style. You know how you mentioned earlier that uh, the brushstrokes just naturally felt like song lyrics. Yeah, these felt to me much more narrative. And, and that posed a real challenge. And a lot of it is quite narrative, but you still wanted to make it a musical experience. And yeah. I think having both Oliver and I on the project was great because you had different musical languages and different approaches as to try to solve this puzzle of depicting a narrative in a very musical style without being cheesy or didactic. You know, those were sort of the two things you didn't want to be. Yeah, I thought that there was a great deal of fun variety uh, among those those poems too by Colleen. I mean you know they they seemed some her voice is not it's not quite so um, definitive or identifiable as James or anything. You know, it seems to kind of change and shift. So the first one that we're going to listen to today is Watermelon Summer. Um, which of you would like to to set up that well that's Steve. Steve so, yeah. so this is this is the, the the young girl coming of age to young womanhood. So I feel more like the the boys who are stealing the watermelons than the actor <laughs> on this one. Um, it's a great story, and as I remember, as I was writing, you kind of had these two planes of reality happening. You know, sort of the 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 more um, uh, emotional, physical side of maturation. And then you had this kind of story about growing watermelons in the patch, and you could kind of take it on both levels. So it it has a again that uh, easy jazzy thing that maybe we default to sometimes when we're doing that. But it's it's a um, my sense is it's a, a little more sophisticated 
note wise, just the, the relationship of music to text was much more challenging to, to make it come off right. And, uh, I hope it tells the story. I think it does. I know Sonia always has a good time singing it when she does it. Um, but uh, it was very much, um, it was harder work for sure than doing things. I think it's just a tiny little miniature piece of musical theater in itself. Yeah, that's a that's a, actually a great way of, of describing it. Yeah, it's a little musical vignette. Yeah. Musical vignette. So we're going to listen to that next. Watermelon Summer. It's a lovely story. Gonna be one hot summer for sure, said Uncle Willie, who had set his heart on growing watermelons in a cindery patch. That is such a great adolescent story. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful coming of age. And our last one is Lullaby of the Child for the Mother. Oliver, yeah. do you want to say a few words about this? Yes. Um, it's hard to follow up on that great story. 
Um, and also, this is uh, kind of more subdued and melancholy, but this is, um, I think, uh, actually, this is the one I, I, I picked up right away. I said, Steve, I, I really want to do this poem. It's a very short one. And it's a very sad one. I mean, it, it's, I, I, think, I think a lot of people know that it's sort of based on a, a family tragedy with the rain is the loss of a child. And um, what Colleen has done in it is she's taken the idea of a, a lullaby and kind of turned it around so that um, you have the mother um, consoling herself on the loss of a child um, by invoking, invoking the voice of that baby, of, of that little child. And then the child becomes the singer of the lullaby uh, to console and to comfort the mother. It's it's a very moving and, and very poignant piece. And um, um, musically, it, again, to me, it just sort of came off the page. It had a, um, you know, very much, uh, I obviously wanted to give it a sort of lullaby rocking feel, that sort of three that time lullabies seem to have. And then just a sort of air of slight mystery. Some of the imagery in it manages to be somehow slightly surreal. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I think I'll just uh, leave the introduction of that. And Great, thank you. So next up, we'll listen to Lullaby of the Child for the Mother. Again, it was just so beautiful. Um, I've been told that we have um, several questions that have come in, so I'd like to maybe move to that part of the program. But before we um, do that, I just want to mention that both of these are from these books. Um, Brushstrokes Decorating a Fan is from James Rainey Sylvester so Home, published in 2005 by Brick Books. And Colleen's poems will be confined in the Artemisia book, uh, also published by Book Book. So I hope that you'll you'll check those out as well. So, um, the questions. Um, I'm interested to know if the text was altered at all for these pieces. 
Not that I recall, no. Uh, and all, all we did was, um, some of them, because they're so short, um, I, at least, in a, I know a book, I just repeated it. And, yeah, I think that's it. And, and then, of course, up a walk, we also repeated it. Uh, we didn't alter it. No, not one bit. Good question, though. It is a very good question, yes, because they read so beautifully. Yeah. Um, a lot of really positive comments on your beautiful collaboration to have the gift of words and music. I'm, I'm seeing these comments. Unfortunately, I'm sitting at some distance from my screen. I'm, I'm, I'd love to read all these comments that are coming in. But yes. And they I seem to be good ones. Yes. I don't think we're getting trolled or anything, so that's good. I just wanted to, to throw in the aspect of, for both Ingrid and Sonia, what, what a pleasure it was to have you both in that performance uh, for this Please. recording, because you really do need to travel both sides of the musical coin, as it were. And, um, you know, our original uh, performers, we Donna Crichton premiered the Colleen songs and uh, Fiona Wilkinson was the original flute player. And uh, all four of you just have that ability to be on on both sides of the street, as it were, um, because you they're not exclusively classical pieces, um, but you need that ability to pull off some recitative and play some fairly technical things. So um, thank you to you both. I just, I'm just so blown away by the performances today and hearing them. So it was a real pleasure to have uh, Sonia and Ingrid along. And of course, Oliver, you're always your charming and fantastic self. <laughs> Uh, but I, let me second what Steve said. And, and by the way, because um, Carol, I think you mentioned something when, when you were introducing Sony just, just back then. Um, it, I mean, it is, and it has. It should be said that, that we, we, we wrote these songs for, for Sony. I mean, Sonia helped us create these songs. I mean, she, yeah. She so said she's a, a partial collaborator as well. Eh? Oh, yeah. You're mm -hmm. quite a few, you're a great collective. <laughs> Well, and you were you were the premier um, uh, presenter, uh, Carolyn, because they were first done at Landon Library. Yeah, for a Landon Library <sighs> evening that we yeah. hosted them there. Yes, yeah, and, and um, I and I believe that Ernie was there that night. I don't think so. I think James. I asked James about that. He said a friend of Ernie or somebody knew Ernie or maybe some distant relative or something. Yeah. But I think he's. I think Ernie was already pretty elderly by that time. I had thought he was there, but I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to confirm this uh, in vain. Yeah. Great. Can I just say something about um, about Colleen's yes. poetry? Yes, sure. I, I I love how how different the styles are, and and to me, that's her her songs are their theater, right? It's a character and divulging their innermost thoughts to you there's something that's extremely personal about them and the the more you sing them and you say the words you start to feel like that person you get a picture of what what they look like and how old they are and you sort of feel yourself becoming that person a little bit I, I was really crushed because when you guys first were developing that show and Adam called me and asked me to do he told me what Colleen was going to be about and I saw a couple of the poems and I had to decline. It was the hardest thing I had to do because I knew it was going to be amazing. But I was pregnant with twins and was feeling pretty sick. And when I saw, especially when I saw how many words there were, I, I thought there is there's no way that I'm going to be able to synthesize all of that because we had a relatively short period of time to put it all together. Um, and I knew I was like, wow, there there are a ton of words, right? It's so many. It's like a, it's a story. There's stories. Um, and I, I, <laughs> I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do justice to that. Also, that it was going to give me, you know, um, like terrors, like worrying about ruining it. So I'm so glad that I did in the end get a chance to, um, to visit these songs because the volume of text is really interesting because it, it is constant and it's constantly evolving text. Yeah. 
and, and that show was interesting because uh, the way Adam uh, put it together, some of the songs had speaking. See, it was a it was, it was a it was a theatrical stage piece with two singers and two spoke speaking performers, uh, and um, some of them had some some of the the, the numbers had uh, you know, interaction alternation between songs and speaking. Yeah, alternating. And uh, some of the letters, some of the letters that uh, yeah. that Stephen Rainey and James had given him. Yeah. yeah. And it was. Uh, kind we of have that. another uh, question that's come in here. Yeah. Um, from someone who's asked, as someone who writes non-rhyming poetry, I'm interested in how different it is writing music for and performing songs without rhyme. Hmm. That's a, that's a terrific question. Yeah. You want to try it well, first? What I just think of is is Leonard Cohen always talked about the tyranny of the rhyme, right? In yeah. his lyrics and and poetry, I think Sonia alluded to it earlier that it's it tends to be the through composed style. Like you, yeah. you, you tend to look for a structure, but it's definitely not a pop song or even a a strophic structure. I mean, you're you're continually evolving, and you try to tie it together with motives and rhythms and language, but yeah. through composed. And I, I mean, that's that's to me what the poetry demands. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like bikini, right? Like every every word, every sentence has its own meaning, and you wouldn't say it twice, right? Like you wouldn't repeat a thought just for the sake of hearing it again. It's it's mm -hmm. it's very different. It's more like opera to me. That's a good analogy. I'm like, you know, handle it Mozart, where you hear the same words over and over again a lot of times. But, but yeah, that it's it. That's the challenge of lacking that sort of what lyrical form in the in the poetry. You know, they're they're not metrical in that way. So. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think it's um, it's it, rhyme. I I I think what. Uh, sorry, I don't know your name. Who asked the question? But I think what you probably were getting at was not just rhyme, but, but meter, a metrical structure, because that's really the more crucial thing. If you don't have a repeating structure of meter in the poem, um, it's, it's a very different kind of, you know, a very different animal as far as setting it to music. Um, and, and, um, but, you know, you, you don't need meter or rhyme to set something to music because there's, I mean, you don't need meter or rhyme in the words because there's still there's still meter in the music. Um, yeah. You can still have a regular repeating musical rhythm, and and you can kind of just play with the words and and warp them and you know possibly do a little word repetition and word painting and all that sort of stuff. And you 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 can use uh, you know words can become a very plastic material. That, that you can you can make them fit into a rhythmic musical form, which 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 is regular and, and, and repeats if you want to, or you can go as Steve says, you can go the route of making it through composed, meaning that there's no repetition necessarily of, of, of melodic form. I mean, it's 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 just every every line goes in in, in, a, in, in a different place. So it's it's in a way it's sort of more. More creative and more inventive. Maybe. Yeah, in the water, in the water, I know there were specific similarities between stanzas, and you could hear that musically. But then there are those passages of almost recitative-like stuff, and and that just didn't fit any kind of met metrical format. But the inflection, eh, the power of musical inflection, like whether the note goes up or down or a long beat, like just those subtle musical things can really inform how you can set set the text to, without meter or rhyme eh? yeah and then some text has has its kind of uh, its own interior rhythms whether whether it's actually written to a specific form or not uh, it, and sounds you know very musical sounds there are other elements of, of the word which are highly musical um, and, and which uh, you could you could use you know you could make those work for you if you're setting music. Yeah. Can I can I say one other thing just as a performer the, the difference between singing things like um, James and Colleen's stuff is that um, 
you know when you really like a piece of music and you'll get an earworm right and and like the melody or like a little part of a phrase will like play over and over and over again in your head and I find with these I mean I get that with the music but I also get that just with the text I find myself like repeating the the text in my head because just the way they've written it out and and the different you know the vocabulary and and just the the turns of phrase are they're so they're so unique and they they stick with me and they they kind of haunt you in in a but in a really good way and to me that's the sign of of some great poetry poetry that like that really reaches you you know yeah any any other questions up there carolyn uh, one more question that we have, um, like, what do you um, feel is the Sowesca influence that comes through James Rainey's work and into your music? Is that something that you were aware of and in working with his pieces for uh, for the composition? Well, we certainly see it a lot in 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 the words in the text. They're full of references to there's yeah, Southwest, Southwest Ontario, um, all through and through, and Colleen as well, all these uh, reminiscences of childhood. Um, I, I find this just, there's something you can identify with or feel, and to me it's a little intangible, but it's it's so cool writing about where you're living, mm -hmm. as opposed to so much of the music that you hear or is about places other than that. And I didn't. I didn't grow up here. I mean, I'm from Thunder Bay, but th there's a connection that I think to me is intangible. That you're actually contributing to what the uh, the, the 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 force of art uh, in this area, uh, and yeah. you just plug into that. You know, the Shaw's life force. You know, you're you're plugging into that in your locale, as to worrying you know, being about Toronto or. America, or even having a global message. I think there's a place for that localized message. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the familiarity, right, of the the situa of the the place, and that you know you the words that are you know like Ernie's and on Huron Street, like they're all places we know, or you know we could potentially know, and so there is that sense of place, and because we live here, that place is very strong to us, whereas the others are more like their dreams almost like if they talk about Europe or Toronto, like we've been there, but we don't, we haven't lived that life and where, I don't know, it just, it's different, right? It's just what you were saying, Steve, exactly. I feel that. Well, everybody writes about Paris and all these other towns, but it's like, it's so cool to hear about the other London, right? London, Ontario. Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, yeah. And I, I mean, I think that that's, that's right. This is what I think it's a very important this has to be said that that um, uh, the the creation of art uh, within a place, um, which which arises from that place and, and and is about that place, makes that place important. You know, it, it, I, I don't I don't want to you know, try to be grandiose about it, but I mean, you know, I mean it just. You know, they talk about a storied place because it has stories about it. You know. I mean, London, England, you know, it's absolutely brimful of stories and literature and Dickens and everything else. And I think, I think it's it's art about a place that's that that adds uh, density, that adds richness to that to that place. So hopefully, we've been trying to sort of um, help to build that. And I always apologize that time in London, what late sixties, early seventies, of Greg Cronow and the Nihilist Spasm Band and. Of course, James was active, very active at that time, and and you know, I kind of long to. I wish I had been part of that because it was such a vibrant art scene. And I think, I don't know, maybe in, in our own little way, it's just contributing to that, uh, the continuation of that artistic spirit in London, Ontario. Well, that seems like a really um, a perfect place to kind of wrap up for our discussion for this afternoon, and. Uh, with this note that you have, each of you brought art into our each individual homes this afternoon, and that's also a beautiful thing. A little bit of London, Ontario, going out across 
the city and and beyond. So I'd like to thank you, um, Stephen and Oliver, Sonia, Ingrid, for such a fabulous um, musical um, production. It's it's been an incredible afternoon. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. I also thanks to Josh. Want to uh, give acknowledgement to Brick Books, you know, who who published these works um, to the Aeolian Hall, uh, where we did the recordings for for these performances uh, just a few weeks ago with their team. To Greg D'Souza, who's done so much of the work in putting it together on this end, and, and to um, all of the Words Festival team and and sponsors. It's it's been. Um, it's been a real privilege to to be a part of this. So thank you. Thank Have you. a good day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. You too. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.